Toronto's light favorites, 98.1 CHFI, and relax with us online at chfi.com. Part of the city, this is the soundtrack to what is artificial and what is real. Good evening, I'm Don Jackson. Richard Dawkins, in the preface to The Selfish Gene, published in 1976, wrote, We are survival machines, robot vehicles blindly programmed to preserve the selfish molecules known as genes. This is a truth which still fills me with astonishment. Richard Dawkins in The Selfish Gene, published in 1976. I couldn't let the month slip by without a mention of two science fiction authors, who recent, or one who recently passed away, the other back on March the 2nd, 1982. Both dealt with the artificial and the very real in their stories. Lovers and other strangers for 98.1 CHFI. Lovers and other strangers, bare naked ladies, lovers in a dangerous time, and John Mayer waiting on the world to change. Do you like our owl? Artificial? Of course it is. Must be expensive. Very. I'm Rachel. Deckard. It seems you feel our work is not a benefit to the public. Replicants are like any other machine. They're either a benefit or a hazard. If they're a benefit, it's not my problem. May I ask you a personal question? Sure. Have you ever retired a human by mistake? No. But in your position, that is a risk. Is this to be an empathy test? Capillary dilation, so-called blush response? Fluctuation of the pupil? Involuntary dilation of the iris. We call it void pomp for short. Mr. Decker, Dr. Eldon Terrell. Demonstrate. I want to see it work. Where's the subject? I want to see it work on a person. I want to see a negative before I provide a positive. What's that going to prove? Indulge me. On you? Try her. The film was based on the 1968 science fiction classic, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? The author was Philip K. Dick. That story was included in the SFBC science fiction collection of his short stories called Counterfeit Unrealities. As it says on the jacket, by 2021, the world war has killed millions, driving entire species into extinction and sending mankind off planet. To promote its emigration program, the government promises each Martian colonist an android. So sophisticated, it's impossible to tell it from a real person. Some Andes superior in intelligence to their owners, but devoid of human empathy, escape to Earth and attempt to blend in. It's Deckard's job to find these rogues and retire them. But when cornered, androids tend to fight back with deadly results. I read the novel. 
was published by SFBC in May of 2004. The story is set in a futuristic San Francisco. Director Ridley Scott's film version, starring Harrison Ford, Rutger Hauer, Sean Young, and Daryl Hannah, is set in Los Angeles, also sometime in the 21st century. The clip you just heard featured Harrison Ford and Sean Young. He's the cop. She's a replicant. Even though both are unaware of her true origins at that point in time in the film. The premise of the film mirrors the original story. A world-weary cop tracks down a handful of renegade replicants synthetically produced human slaves who with only days of life left search madly for some way to extend their prescribed lifetimes as video hounds golden movie retriever said moody beautifully photographed a dark thriller with sets from an architect's dream unquote they hired futurists Sid Mead and Lawrence Hall to help in creating the film's ambiance, the futuristic stylings. The city shrouded in darkness after the war, a radioactive rain constantly falling, flying hover cars up among the skyscrapers, animated billboards that Hawk wears, and a population of those who, for one reason or another, have remained behind on Earth, who haven't emigrated to Mars. 2007 marked the 25th anniversary of the film. 2006 marked the 25th anniversary of the death of the author, author rather, who envisioned this dark future. It's available on VHS, DVD, the director's cut eliminates Ford's narration, which I happen to like. The story in the film is really all about telling the difference between what's real and what's not. We don't have to wait until 2021. Human beings today are still having their problems trying to decide what's real and what's counterfeit in their own lives. Lovers and other strangers. From 98.1 CHFI. Lovers and other strangers. The Supremes with reflections and five for fighting with the riddle. The electric things have their lives too, paltry as those lives are. The characters played by Sean Young and Harrison Ford, the male and female leads, are speaking in a hotel room in the original story that Blade Runner was based on. She says, I'm not alive, to which he responds, legally, you're not but really you are, biologically. You're not made out of transistorized circuits like a false animal. You're an or organic entity. And in two years he thought you'll wear out and die because we never solved the problem of cell replacement. Unquote. Owen Lieberman in the July 23rd, 04 issue of Entertainment Weekly, said this about the film, I, Robot. And I quote, The robots exist according to three laws that have been hardwired into their systems. They can never harm a human. They must follow every human order, so long as it doesn't require them to break law one. And they must protect their own existence without breaking laws one or two." Unquote. But such wasn't the case in the film Blade Runner. We need to learn the lessons these early science fiction writers and filmmakers endeavored to teach every one of us about the dangers inherent in runaway technology. Slow and easy would be the best route to take, but of course we want it yesterday. If you need any more proof, then just remember how. In Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey, in the novel written by Arthur C. Clarke, Hal might have been able to sing Daisy on cue, but I wouldn't want him in charge of my life support systems.
lovers, you know, they're strangers. From 98.1 CHFI. Lovers and other strangers, Jack Soul and Can't Stop, and Dave certainly began to question the mental health of Hal in 2001, A Space Odyssey. I mentioned Arthur C. Clarke. He recently passed away at the age of 90. Even at that advanced age, he was still a vital force in the science fiction genre. He certainly gave us lots to think about concerning our headlong rush to the future. My companion writing is also artificial tonight. Log on to the CHFI website. Follow the links on the homepage to my blog at chfi.com. And Lovers and Other Strangers returns. I'm Don Jackson. Romance set to words and music. Lovers and Other Strangers on 98.1 CHFI. Toronto's light favorites, 98.1 CHFI, and relax with us online at chfi.com. And welcome back to the artificial lives of lovers and other strangers, now a blog as well, at chfi.com. I'm Don Jackson. The author, Philip K. Dick, was born December 16th, 1928, died March 2nd, 1982. Thought we might devote the hour to the memory of this imaginative science fiction writer, even though his work might not qualify as romantic in the true sense of the term. And yet there was an element of romance in some of the relationships he created for his characters. There definitely was a clear message in many of his stories about our man-made future. But if you listen carefully, you may hear some themes we've touched on with this program in the past. Merriam-Webster's Encyclopedia of Literature said this about his life and his work, and I quote, American science fiction writer whose novels and short stories often depict the psychological struggles of characters trapped in illusory environments. He worked briefly in radio before studying at the University of California at Berkeley for one year. The publication of his first story in 1952 launched his full-time writing career. He published his first novel, Solar Lottery, three years later. The theme of a reality at variance with what it appears was intended to be and remained his central preoccupation. Culminating in Do Android's dream of electric sheep, the illusion centers on artificial creatures at large in a real world of the future. Unquote. And you know we're not that far off. We've cloned sheep, not electric sheep, mind you. And I would imagine research continues in the field of cloning, which brings the issue of souls to the forefront. When we make a duplicate copy, does the duplicate have a soul in the traditional sense of the word? And concerning thinking machines, there is talk that when we create a quantum computer, that's exactly what we will have created. And will the quantum computer of the not-too-distant future have a soul? The transporter technology that we marveled in in the Star Trek franchise of series and movies. In a sense, what that technology was supposed to do was unscramble all your molecules, transport them from one location to another, then reassemble them. I've heard it said that to do it for real, you would end up making a copy of the original. And if that was the case, what about the soul? Would that end up being reproduced or would it be scattered during transport? We have to be careful of relying too heavily on the machines we create. If you saw any of the Terminator movies, then you know what could be another scenario for a future where man and machine collide. Lovers and other strangers. From 98.1 CHFI. 
lovers and other strangers. Sarah McLaughlin with World on Fire. In our society, we have no major crimes. But we do have a uh, detention camp full of would-be criminals. An excerpt from The Minority Report, written by Philip K. Dick. This story was one in a collection of his short stories contained in a Citadel Press book published by Kensington Publishing in May of 02, called The Minority Report and Other Classic Stories. If you saw the Steven Spielberg film Minority Report starring Tom Cruise, this was the story it was based on. The police in this version of the future are able to predict a crime before it happens and make an arrest before the crime is ever committed. Good idea? Some would say yes. There is an argument though for both sides. The author gives us so much to consider in this tale. Is it ethical to prosecute a crime that hasn't been committed? And what if the version of the future that one of the three so-called precogs is seeing has slightly different information on it? The Minority Report. His stories made us think about where technology is ultimately headed. That aspect was very apparent in the Steven Spielberg film. An implant in every member of society would pick up advertising messages bombarded at them as they passed by stores they've done business with in the past. You get the impression that the minds of this future society are filled with voices that they can't turn off. Tom Cruise's character finds a radical, painful way to become anonymous when he has this implant removed in the film. I won't go into details. But you know, we're not that far away from similar devices. Some current futurists predict a time when you'll have an implant embedded under the skin that you'll wave in front of a reader, like one that scans for barcodes. Instead of having to pay cash or fumble in your wallet for your debit or credit card, all you'll have to do is walk past this reader and the transaction will be complete. And if you think that is pure science fiction, consider this. Tom Reagan, columnist for the Christian Science Monitor, wrote, More cell phones have GPS locators, about 20% now, 50% within five years. On one hand, you'll soon see mobile features that will let you track your friends. On the other hand, every time you get too close to a store, you'll receive a coupon on your cell phone that is only good if you come in now. Unquote. Alone with your thoughts won't seem such a frightening prospect in a world where everybody wants in has found a way in. Lovers and other strangers from 98.1 CHFI. Lovers and other strangers, Gordon Lightfoot, and if you could read my mind. I read another science fiction novel by the author called Ubik contained in the collection Counterfeit Unrealities. It featured as a premise that when your loved ones die, they are quickly frozen before all brainwave activity is gone. And at a holding facility, dressed up like a mortuary, grieving relatives get a chance to communicate with their loved ones through electronic means. For those who can't bear the thought of letting their loved ones go, they at least can visit them and communicate with them, but at a very dear price. The more they access the remaining thoughts, the faster the inevitable end comes. Eventually, there will be no more communication. There are only so many times you can speak with the dead in this story. 
you've had a loved one pass away suddenly, then you've probably wished you could go back even one day into the past and say the things you never got the chance to. The story gives us that chance, but we must ensure that we don't waste the opportunity. What that aspect of the story said to me was that we shouldn't waste the time we're given with our loved ones right now that we should say the words. As it said on the inner jacket of this collection published in May of 02 by the SFBC Science Fiction publishers about the author, Philip Dick may have invented more wildly imaginative creations per novel than any of its peers. An eccentric whose mind danced on the blurry edge between illusion and reality, madness and metaphysics he produced a body of work that no science fiction reader should ignore. Unquote. He actually believed that he was misplaced in this universe, at odds with the world around him. And in hindsight, maybe he was. But he certainly gave us reason to be cautious. Not to be too enamored about runaway technology. And those who would try to use that technology for their own gain. Ninety-eight point one CHFI. Stay tuned. Lovers and other strangers returns. I'm Don Jackson. Your life set to words and music. Lovers and other strangers on 98.1 CHFI. Toronto's light favorites, 98.1 CHFI. And relax with us online at chfi.com. We're in the heart of Toronto, around the world on the internet, and now a blog as well at chfi.com. My companion writing is also artificial. Log on right now to the CHFI website. Follow the links on the homepage to all my blogs posted at chfi.com. Good evening once again. I'm Don Jackson. Jane Goodsell of Press Associates and featured in the February 93 issue of the Reader's Digest magazine wrote something called Temptations I Can't Resist. One of her temptations is to, and I quote, feel houseplants to find out whether they're real or not. Artificial. Tonight, lovers and other strangers from 98.1 CHFI. Lovers and other strangers, Sarah Sleem, that's called Get Home, and Annie Lennox, and why? Sarah Sleem from the album The Baroness. Auden. In the shield of Achilles wrote, she looked over his shoulder for vines and olive trees, marble, well-governed cities, and ships on wine-dark seas. But there on the shining metal, his hands had put instead an artificial wilderness and a sky like lead. counterfeit on realities. And I guess you could say, in a sense, we visit them all the time. In fact, we look forward to the escape. Barbara Kingsolver from High Tide in Tucson, published by HarperCollins, wrote, Literature duplicates the experience of living in a way that nothing else can, drawing you so fully into another life that you temporarily forget you have one of your own. That is why you read it, and might even sit up in bed till dawn, throwing your whole tomorrow out of whack, simply to find out what happens to some people who you know perfectly well, 
are made up. Unquote. A film a while back called A Love Song to Bobby Long, released in 04, starring John Travolta and Scarlett Johansson. In this film, a young woman returns to her childhood home in Louisiana after her mother's death, finds the house inhabited by two men, one a professor and another a failed writer. Both men are alcoholics. There was a line that mirrored, in a sense, that last quote. It may have been the professor who said, who said something to the effect that a book is better than real life because life makes sense in a book. It's probably part of the reason why we yearn to escape this real world for the fictional world that seems to make more sense. Lovers and other strangers from 98.1 CHFI. Lovers and other strangers sting. If I ever lose my faith in you, and the guess who's sour sweet. Speaking of films, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. That starred Jim Carrey and Kate Winslet. When their relationship goes bad, Kate Winslet's character turns to a company that can erase all memories of their relationship. It's a fairly lengthy, complex procedure. And after hearing she's done this, Jim Carrey's character decides to do the same thing. But during the procedure, he decides in his mind, while he's having his memories erased, that he doesn't want to forget. He tries to hide his memories away from the probing eyes of the computer program that's seeking and destroying them. It's part romantic comedy, part drama, released in 2004, filled with special effects, it gives us pause to make sure we're certain that we want what technology has to offer. Because once they're in, it's almost impossible to get them out. Lovers and Other Strangers from 98.1 CHFI Lovers and other strangers, Sarah McLaughlin, and I will remember you. My companion writing is also artificial. Log on to the CHFI website, follow the links on the homepage to my blog at chfi.com. And Lovers and Other Strangers returns. I'm Don Jackson. Sit back, relax, and enjoy. This is Lovers and Other Strangers on 98.1 CHFI. Toronto's light favorites, 98.1 CHFI. And relax with us online at chfi.com. And welcome back to the Artificial Lives of Lovers and Other Strangers. Now a blog as well at chfi.com. I'm Don Jackson. A chilling prediction for the future. Margaret Wheatley from A Simpler Life wrote, I cannot just heave everything I know into the abyss, but I know it is coming. And when it comes, when I've made my sacrificial offerings to the gods of understanding, then the ruptures will cease. Healing waters will cover the land, giving birth to new life, burying forever the ancient rusting machines of my past understandings and on those waters I will set sail to places I now only imagine there I will be blessed with new visions and new magic I will feel once again like a creative contributor to this mysterious world but for now I wait an act of faith Margaret Wheatley from a simpler life. The program tonight is about reality. The reality we create in our minds and the reality of the world around us. The quality of our lives, our hopes, and our dreams. Linda Ellerby on her battle with breast cancer from Primetime Live on ABC said, and I quote, We human beings are remarkable. 
We plant trees knowing that by the time they're big enough to climb, we'll be too old to climb them. We write constitutions for people who won't be born for 100 years and may not deserve them. And we try to take care of our sick, although we all have a disease we're going to die from, which I think makes us very brave. And in the course of that, we sometimes stand tall and take the time to look at the sun and laugh. I've always felt that laughter in the face of reality is probably the finest sound there is and will last until the day when the game is called on account of darkness. In this world, a good time to laugh is any time you can. Lovers and other strangers from 98.1 CHFI. Lovers and other strangers. Amy Sky, Do You Dance? And the Beatles, and Let It Be. Mark Twain said, I think we never become really and genuinely our entire honest selves until we are dead. And not then until we've been dead years and years. People ought to start dead. And they would be so much, so honest, so much earlier. Words of Mark Twain. There's very little, you know, that we can do in society that isn't directly related to computer technology. It's everywhere. And when they crash, we find out quickly just how much we rely on these things. Maybe we rely on them a little too much. Think about it. It affects every part of your life. And just that fact should maybe give you pause for some concern. My children have never really known a world without computers. We work with machines everywhere. At work, we have complex computers, larger machines for manufacturing what is needed for our society to function. In years past, we were able to leave our work behind us at the end of the day and come home to a house that had offered respite from the working day. But with home computers, laptops, modems, email, the internet, fax machines, we can do most of our work from home or bring some of that work home with us. And there are people who spend most of their lives, their real lives, online in cyberspace. And they might tell you it's more exciting than the real world we inhabit. That's the one thing the specials in Philip K. Dick's Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep have a hard time coping with. The loneliness. Part of the reason why the authors, humans, left behind on the planet, gravitate towards something called an empathy box. They don't want to feel so all alone. When we need relaxation, we fill our homes with every time-saving device on the market. Our TV rooms are now just as good as the movie theater with the introduction of home theater. Our lives are intricately connected to the machines we've made. But if you believe the premise of the Terminator movies, we should be careful not to become too reliant on our machines. We should be more reliant on each other and strive to strengthen that connection as the special. In Philip K. Dick's Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep said, you have to be with other people in order to live at all. Lovers and other strangers from 98.1 CHFI. Lovers and other strangers, James Blunt, and you're beautiful. Norbert Weiner, and this was written in 1964, said, The future offers very little hope. For those who expect that our new mechanical slaves will offer us a world in which we may rest from thinking. Help us they may, but at the cost of supreme demands upon our honesty and our intelligence. 
The world of the future will be an ever more demanding struggle against the limitations of our intelligence. Not a comfortable hammock in which we can lie down to be waited upon by our robot slaves. I've seen Attack ships on fire for the children of the lion. I watched sea beams glittering in the dark in ten hours a day. All those moments will be lost in time. Like tears. Ninety-eight point one CHFI. My companion writing is also artificial, and it's on the CHFI website at chfi.com in my blog section. Just follow the links on the homepage. That concludes another chapter of Lovers and Other Strangers. Lovers and Other Strangers returns long after the sun sets. Good night, sweet dreams. I'm Don Jackson. Your life set to words and music, lovers and other strangers on 98.1 CHFI.